Okay. All right, looks like it's about two o'clock here central time. So we are gonna get started. And then if other people trickle in, they can just hop right along. I wanna thank you all for coming. It's nice to see some friendly names on the screen here. Um, I am Amanda Niebauer. I'm the Certification and Communications Manager at VAC. So today we wanted to um, give our certificates a clear and in-depth in depth um, analysis of what our recertification by CE process is all about, as well as a little bit of a look into our audit process so that when you, um, if you're selected for the audit, you kind of know how to navigate that and you're able to pass that easily first time. Um, we're mostly going to be focusing on the recertification by CE process as that's the process that we see the most questions on. And also because when you are taking the recertification exam, it's going to be pretty much the same thing as um, the same process as when you took the exam the first time around. So usually a little bit less questions on that. So the types of questions we're going to go over today are anything from submitting CEs, like do they all have to be included in one file or should I separate them? Or to the validity of CEs, um, questions like can I get all my CEs from one conference? Or um, let's say I gave a presentation at work and I'm not sure if it would count or not, can you help me out? So that's kind of the, the scope that we're gonna be going through today. Um, if you have any questions while we're going through these, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll get to them um, as we're kind of wrapping up with that question make sure we bookend that. Otherwise, feel free to save them until the end where we'll have a little bit more of an open Q&A. You can always just type those in the chat as well. And don't feel like you have to really hurriedly be typing that or writing down notes or anything like that, we will post this a recording of this session up on our site and we will email out the link to that to all of our certificates as well. So you guys should be getting the follow-up for this as well. So no worries about having to ask for slides, ask to slow down, anything like that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hudson Garrett. He served as the first vice president of VAC um, when the organization was originally formed. He was then elected as the president of the board of directors for two terms and served as the presidential advisor. In addition, he is the chairperson for the Judicial Ethics and Disciplinary Committee for VAC. He was the co-developer of the VAC Industry Partner Program and has held the VABC certification since the credential was initially launched. He serves as VAC's consulting clinical auditor, and is an adjunct assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. So please welcome Dr. Garrett. Awesome. Thank you very much, Amanda, and good afternoon to each of you. And I, I'm really thrilled that we're doing this. I think the timing is, is amazing. And really kudos to Amanda and Brian, our executive director back at the back offices for agreeing to host this webinar for each of you today. I will also be posting this um, following. We've got colleagues that I know reached out to Amanda and team to ask about the availability. So this recording will be available as well. Um, as she mentioned, our goal is to make this completely and 100% about you. Uh, we want to make this an interactive forum so that if you've got specific questions, we can answer those um, really centered around the recertification process and frankly to make sure we give you every possible avenue to be successful in your recertification journey. Um, and so we're going to essentially look at every possible pathway that you can take. Um, whether that's recertification uh, through CE, and, and certainly you can obviously do that via exam as well. Not something I would want to do. I think most of us would agree we don't want to take that test again, um, but certainly there's lots of different options that we'll discuss. So let's go ahead and dive into the questions, and these were really pulled from the most commonly asked questions that we have, um, and we'll stop and see if there's any questions as we go um, through this as well. But Really, the first one is probably the most important, right? This is the one that we hear all the time. And it's really if you have all of your credits were earned from a single conference, right? So let's say that you go to the INS or the AVA conference or some other type of VASCR access conference, um, do those need to be uploaded as one single entry or separate in, uh, entry, right? So it really, it boils down into two different buckets. Uh, so let's say that you go to an AVA conference as an example, and they give you a master CE sheet. And they say, hey, you earned 36 hours over the duration of this conference. Uh, then VAC is perfectly fine with you uploading that into the portal. 
um, and you can go ahead and do that. It needs to have some basic information though, so that we can account for the fact that it's relevant to your recertification, such as the title of the session. It needs to certainly have the date so we can mark that. And then the number of hours of credit that were issued. Some sessions we understand may be more than one hour. Um, and so it would be hour for hour credit. Outside of that, we'd ask that you upload those C activities individually um, if, if they're not part of a, a sort of master conference. And we'll talk about sort of how the credits need to be spread it, sort of spread out um, over the, the time period here in just a second. So that's sort of the, the first question. Uh, Amanda, anything that you wanted to add to that one? Um, nope, just that um, each CE activity, if they're um, from, let's say, different conferences or you gave a presentation at work and also took a online course, those would need to be separated and each uploaded individually. But other than that, like Hudson said, um, if they are all from the same conference, that could be all included in that one big file. Right. And, and one of the things, too, that I'll mention is the advantage of the online portal is twofold. One is it gives you that direct conduit to the staff at VAC so that as you put that information in there, Amanda and team can go in there and see it uh, so that if there's any type of audit, they can instantly pull it. But it also helps you track for yourself where you are towards your recertification goal. Um, you know, if you're anything like me, sometimes you lose that particular folder. And so having that electronically there uh, is always helpful to make sure that everything is tracked. We want to make sure you get credit for everything that you've earned um, and then some. And it's always good to have a backup um, as well. So let's literally move on to the next question, which is about the digital badging. Uh, first, if you've not taken advantage of this, we would strongly encourage you to do so. It's a great feature. You'll notice on sort of, I guess, the right side of Amanda's head, uh, you can see uh, in her digital background there that she's got the, the badge. Um, this is a fantastic way to share your accomplishment with your peers, your colleagues, your family, friends, certainly employers, and have a verifiable way to say that you're currently certified, right? So there's a lot of infrastructure that was invested in order to issue those. Um, but those digital badges can't be issued until the entire audit process is completed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, but audits are really selected randomly. And so once the individual's that are gonna be audited or notified. Uh, then the VAC team will release the other digital badges for those people that are not selected to be audited that have met all recertification criteria. So that is gonna be before your actual current certification expires. I know in years past, that's been a concern and there's been some changes made to the process to account for that. So rest assured that if you are not selected for audit, you will receive that new digital badge via email and then you can go ahead and claim that prior to your current expiration. So our goal here is to make sure you get your new one before the, the current one ever expires. And that way you're good to go with your employer, your HR department, uh, whatever it may be. Now, individuals that are selected for the audit would of course not receive their digital badge until they're cleared from that audit process, which can be very quick if you have all of your documentation uploaded um, as well. Amanda, anything you wanna to add to that one? Nope, that all sounds good. Perfect. So let's get into a really critical question um, about sort of the notifications. Um, now, before we ever talk about notifications, we need to talk about the first part, which is really that you can only get notified if we have your contact information. So for Brian and Amanda to, to do their job and, and send you out this email that's really important that gives you a heads up you've got to have your correct email address in here. Um, I would strongly, strongly recommend that you use a personal email address. Uh, we want to make sure that you receive this email, that it doesn't go to a spam filter, it doesn't get blocked. Uh, maybe you change roles and you go from one hospital to another, for example. Use something that's going to be an email that you'll constantly have access to. So whether that's your Gmail, AOL, whatever it may be. Um, as long as your information's in the portal, uh, you'll receive a total of at least five reminders. Um, and we've sort of broken this down. So the first reminder you'll receive is about 10 months out from your current expiration date. You'll receive a second reminder six months out. Uh, you'll receive a third reminder you'll see sort of escalating closer. Uh, not, uh, I'm sorry, 60 days, your fourth reminder at 30 days, and your fifth reminder at five days. Now, there may be times where you'll receive more than that, uh, but this is what we can guarantee is that you'll receive a total of five. Um, it is really important, though, that you be checking your emails, right? It is not our responsibility to make sure you get recertified. We will do everything in our power to give you the tools and the resources and the knowledge. Um, but at the end of the day, it's your certification and it's your responsibility to maintain it. Um, so our, the staff's goal especially is to make sure they can bend over backwards to help you in any way they can. But this is an accredited exam and there are some things that go with it. 
that we can't be flexible on, such as you know ex expiration dates and things like that. So just keep that in mind. Total five reminders. They'll come to you via email. Ensure you're using an email that you have ready, readily access to. Um, and again, it's it's your responsibility is holding that certification. So here's another fantastic question, and I really give kudos to Amanda for bringing this one forward, is, oh my gosh, I moved or I forgot or the pandemic, whatever the reason is, you let your certification lapse, right? And so, you know, immediately after that certification lapses, you no longer have that certification, you can't use the credential. However, there is this late after suspension window that allows you an opportunity prior to the next testing cycle. And remember that we offer the testing cycle in June and December annually. Um, unless there's some type of special seating that's offered with a conference, for example, you can still submit those 30 credits and have the opportunity to reinstate your certification. Now, I want to be very clear, from the time period that you expire to the time period that you renew it, you cannot use the credential, right? You are, you're currently expired. You will not be listed on the website as certified. You will show as not certified. Um, but you are able to use this very short window in order to reinstate your certification. So, you know, this is a great option that we hope you never have to use, um, but it is in there in case of the catastrophic emergency takes place. And certainly with COVID, we had a few people that took advantage of this um, just due to, to other responsibilities that they had. But through your certification, you got plenty of time to do this, but we wanted to make sure that you had sort of this backup option um, should there be any issues. Uh, Amanda, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, only one thing for the email part. Um, sure. If you notice that you're not getting any emails from us, feel free to give us a call. Um, it may be that you unsubscribed from an email list in the past or something like that, or maybe your email is just written down wrong. Um, so we're always happy to be able to help you take care of that in any way we can, but otherwise everything else sounds great. Awesome. So this is a, a, a direct screenshot from the current candidate handbook. And I, I want to just reference that for those that watch the recording. So this will change um, certainly as, as dates change with certain things. But you can notice at the very bottom line there that the late after suspension prior to next test cycle, you'll see the relative dates there, right? Those are the dates that you had that sort of flexible window, but it's a very limited window in order to get that credential back before you completely expire and have to retake the exam, right? Our goal is again to work with you in any way possible to make sure you can maintain that exam. You worked hard for it. We're proud for you to have it. Um, and we wanna make sure that you can retain it um, in any way that we can to be flexible and work with you for sure. So let's talk about the uh, elephant in the room, which is the one that scares people all the time, which is, oh my gosh, Amanda just emailed me and I'm getting audited. Um, then they're done that. Right. I even got audited when I was on the board and people thought that was hilarious. Um, I, I think it's a necessary um, evil, right, that allows us to make sure that we're all accountable to the patients that we serve. Right. The whole purpose of VAC existing is to provide for professional accredited certification, but to protect patients. Right. Which is why there is an actual patient advocate on the board of directors. Um, you know, this is that public member that is responsible for making sure that, hey, the things that we do as an organization that certifies are going to protect the end users, which are our patients. Um, and so this is a, a sort of a, and we'll talk about sort of audit um, randomly, and then I'll talk about audit with calls here for just a second. So the random audit is a double blinded randomized audit that's not even conducted by the VAC staff. It's actually done by an external vendor that they partner with. So Amanda would then be provided with the list of people that are audited based on the percentage that they randomly select. Um, those individuals then receive an email that said, you know, I shouldn't say congratulations, but you've been selected for an audit. Um, and so we need you to submit this documentation in order to clear the audit. And normally that's a very straightforward process, especially if you have everything in the portal. It is very simple. We pull the information out of the portal. We review it, make sure it's applicable. It meets all the standards. And then you're cleared from the audit. That can be done extremely quickly. Now, if you don't have your information in the portal, um, or if it's not correct, or it doesn't meet the requirements, then we'll give you an opportunity to rectify that. That's why I always say it's almost like when you think about tax season, uh, you always want to have a little bit of extra receipts in case you need them for your accountant. You want to have extra CEs in case you need them for Amanda. Um, so, you know, have a little bit of a backup file with a couple extra things that you might have in the bag should you ever need them. Uh, and that way you've got that. So they will send a total of three different email notifications, right? And, and sort of alerting you to this audit. It is completely up to you to respond to that. If you don't respond to the audit, then your certification will lapse. 
um, because you have not responded to the audit, therefore you've not met the recertification requirements. Um, and it's really key to do this as quickly as possible. Um, so if you can do this early in that process, so let's say that Amanda sends it to you on December 14th and you get back to her on December 15th and you have everything in there, chances are by December 16th, you're probably gonna be cleared. Um, you know, or somewhere around that time period because she already has the documentation, you responded very quickly, um, and the goal is sort of first in, first out to make sure we take care of you. Um, but if you do wait until the very last day of that recertification cycle, so if we just use December as the upcoming example, let's say you wait to, you know, 11.59 p.m. on December 31st, Amanda is not going to be sitting at her computer, and therefore your certification will lapse. Um, and so it's not going to be listed on the website as you're currently certified and, until she goes in and actually validates the information and all the documentation clears you from the audit audit only then will the, the website be updated in your digital badge issue to show that you're currently recertified right so in that time period if because you waited you cannot use that credential so just something to, to make sure you're aware of um, from an employer standpoint uh, as well Amanda anything you'd like to contribute to that question um, that sounds all perfect. Yeah, the uh, only thing that I will I'll really reiterate there is um, making sure that you get things in on time. You don't want to have the wrong email address like we talked about before or not be um, checking your email and think, oh, I have plenty of time for this. And all of a sudden you have like a day left and you have a bunch of questions for us. So just make sure you're being timely. Um, if you noticed you haven't heard anything from us either way either with a pass or a, you've been selected for the audit, also reach out to us. That might've just been a miscommunication on, on our end or our email went to junk mail. And just for clarity, Amanda, will the email come from the info address or will it come directly from your uh, back account? Good question. So um, it'll come from our general VAC email account. So first you'll get an email from VAC saying, congratulations, you passed, um, if that's the case. And then you'll get your digital badge if you've passed and that'll come um, it'll say something like uh, badge cert badge is ready, something similar to that. Um, and then if you are selected for the audit, we do send out a personal email to you also from our general VAC account, but it's a little bit more personalized and you get um, the <laughs> list of questions that we have for you. Okay. And is that just to make sure people, because what I'm getting at, I think it's, especially for those of you that have like iPhones and Androids and I know it does this as well, you can star that email address and make that a VIP so that if you know you were to ever receive an email from back, it will automatically go to the top of the list. So I just suggest strongly that you go get that email out. You know, it should be the same one that they received the invite for today's webinar, correct, Amanda? Yep. Info at VACERT.org. So info at VACERT.org. Yep. So I would just store that, make sure that's a primary contact, and that way it pops up pretty quickly. Um, so great, great suggestion. Uh, so let's talk about one of the other very common questions that comes up about, well, I went to this great conference and I was there for a week and I got all 30 CE credits and I'm done for all three years, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's not the answer, right? And, and the reason being, this is not a, a VAC decision per se. This is really in accordance with good certification practices, right? Because this is a three-year limit um, as far as your recertification. Our, our goal is to make sure that you maintain competency over those three years for that cognitive knowledge. Uh, that being said, the, the sort of recertification requirements per the candidate handbook so that you need to spread that out. Um, so what I've done is I, I've sort of developed three different options here to give you sort of what that could look like um, based on what we commonly hear. So over that sort of three years, and we'll just go example by example. So let's say in year one, you get 15 credits. Year two, you get zero. You just can't go to a conference. Maybe that was the COVID year. And then this year, you're going to get 15 more credits. So you get a total of 30, right? So that is going to meet the requirements for the 30. So checkbox there. But it also meets the requirements for dis uh, sort of distributing it over uh, the time period of your recertification. So what we're looking for is credits in two or more years. So not one year, but two or more years. So let's look at the second example, and this is a common one. So let's say that you get your exam and you say, great, I'm going to go to that conference this year and I'm going to take care of all my CE. And you get 30 credits in one conference. 
while that's great to get 30 credits, you didn't get any other credits in year two or year three. So yes, you've met the 30, but you've not met the distribution that's required over the period of the three-year recertification. So that would not be an acceptable recertification. And then the last one, which is what we're ideally looking for from a continued competence standpoint, is year one, you get 15 credits, year two, you get 10 more, and then maybe in year three, you do a symposium at your local INS or AVA chapter or something like that, and you get an initial five. So you still got your 30 credits, but you actually did the best thing, which is distribute it out over the entire three years. So again, just quick summary, you need to have 30 total credits, and we'll show you how you can get to the 30 here in a minute, and it needs to be distributed in at least two of the three years over your recertification cycle. So we hope that this, this sort of visual um, is helpful to make sure. And, and certainly if you wanna get more credits in years, we certainly support that. Um, but we wanna make sure that you're successful with your recertification. And again, this is really uh, in good accordance with uh, certification practices to make sure that uh, all of our certificates are maintained competency over that recertification time period. So what about the types of presentations that you can count for credit? Um, so we've sort of broken this down a little bit. We've also included the matrix at the end of the, the session today. We'll also show you the content outline that we'll refer to here in just a minute. But you can certainly use um, any non-accredited conference seminar or workshop or an accredited program, right, that's relative to vascular access. So let's say that your hospital does a six-hour program on vascular access, but they don't offer CEs. Um, that still would count because that's a conference, a seminar, or a workshop. What we're not looking for is an in-service. Um, we don't want to see a one-hour in-service because that's really most likely going to be something product-specific or maybe offered by a vendor. Um, certainly the gold standard here that will keep you in completely clear form is to have a CE accredited event that's related to vascular access. It makes it a lot easier for Amanda and the team to sort of validate that. Um, and what we're looking for from a CE standpoint is something with either national or state CE accreditation. So I know from a nursing perspective, most people use either ANCC or the California board, totally fine. Physicians, anything that's CME accredited, uh, certainly our respiratory colleagues, AARC, uh, if it's an EMS professional, NAMT. So any of the national approvers are completely fine. You don't need to get it pre-approved. As long as you've got a certificate with that approver on there, we're good to go. Um, and again, the most important thing is to also make sure that the content is directly relative back to the vascular access exam. And so we'll talk about how to do that here in just a second. Um, another comment that I'll mention here, and this is sort of a generality, is that for the most part, uh, the content that's going to be presented at the National uh, AVA conference as well as the National INS conference is going to generally um, be applicable towards uh, VA uh, BC recertification. That being said, there may be certain sessions that do not. And I'll just give you an example that I gave to uh, Amanda that sort of made her laugh. So let's say that uh, AVA or INS hires Oprah Winfrey. Um, and she comes in as a motivational speaker and talks about something completely unrelated to vascular access, that there is no direct correlation back to any of the content on the exam that would not meet the criteria for related to vascular access. Um, and so those will be few and far between, um, but it's really up to you to make sure that you maintain that documentation. What I'd recommend doing is just keeping a copy of that brochure. Um, that's the easiest way to have that. Just file it away. You can scan it digitally. Uh, you know, you can also do it off their websites and save it as a PDF, upload that with your CE is totally fine. And then that way, if there's ever a question, uh, you can go back and use that as a sort of justification. So let's talk about what I think is the exciting part, which is options, right? I am all about options. Um, you know, you may be somebody who is in a hospital. You may be somebody who is a clinician that works in industry. Uh, maybe you work on an ambulance. It doesn't matter, right? There are different CE options that are available for you. And so you can see these sort of broken down. These are directly from the candidate handbook. So if you're doing some type of conference, seminar, or workshop, and it's related to the topic of vascular access, as long as it's a 50 to 60 minute session, because we know that's our normal CE accreditation, you get hour for hour credit. Um, and that is for a non-accredited activity. If you do an accredited activity, again, you're gonna get hour for hour for that particular event. Now, some of you have used this, these next two, which I think is fantastic. Maybe you're pursuing a master's degree or a doctorate or a certificate program or something else that's academic that awards credit and you have classes or the degree is directly related to vascular access. 
we want to make sure you get credit for that as well. Um, so I don't know a ton of people that are still in the quarter based system, but there are a few. Um, so you would get one uh, quarter hour credit. Um, if, sorry, if it's one quarter hour credit, you get three CE points. And if it's one semester hour credit, you get five CE points. So let's say that you have two classes related to vascular access that are semester based terms, you would get a total of 10, um, uh, 10 total credits there. And then if you go for the big gold and you get your master's thesis and you defend it or your PhD dissertation, that also would include a DNP, PharmD, any of the doctoral degrees, uh, then you would be awarded an additional 10 points. So as you can see, just right off the bat, there are many different ways to get to where you need to go with your recertification journey. There's also some other options that many of you may take advantage of. So let's say that you have an exciting experience that took place at your facility and you want to share it and you get accepted at one of the national conferences to do a poster presentation, fantastic. We want you to get rewarded for that. So you get an hour um, of credit there, you get another point. Um, if you do a presentation, let's say you're doing something at one of those big events or even at your local event, um, you get credit for presenting. So what we do is if you're doing an hour presentation, we really give you an hour to teach it and an hour of preparation time. Now, let me be very clear, as somebody who writes lots of presentations, no, an hour is not enough but that's what we could do to be very fair. Um, so everybody gets a minimum of two hours. Now there's a little bit of a caveat with that, with both the poster and the presentations. Um, if you present that at multiple different conferences or venues or to different groups, right? You only get credit for that same presentation one time. So let's say that Amanda says, Hudson, I want you to go out and do this same presentation for five different groups. I can only upload that towards recertification once for this same presentation. Now, if I have five different presentations, that's fair game. But if I have one single presentation for five different audiences, I can only use that thing once. And then below are some of the more rarely used categories, um, such as if you're doing some type of abstract, um, if you write an article. So let's say you publish something in Java or some of the other professional journals, um, then it, it gives you three points. Um, if you do a chapter in a book, you'll get um, five points uh, and then if you actually publish a book, uh, you should probably get a thousand points, but you only get 15. So um, kudos if you're able to do any of those. But, you know, again, you can see very quickly how these points can add up over that three year period. You only need 30. So maybe you go to a conference and you get 20. You only need 10 more. There are lots of different opportunities. And many of these you can do completely for free online through different accredited sources. So one of the other questions that comes up a lot now, I'll again bring up the content outline when we finish the slides, is how in the world do I know if my CE will apply? Um, and so my absolute 100% answer is to go back to the VAC exam content outline, which is available on the VAC website, uh, and that's the, the vacert.org. 99% um, of what you're looking for is contained there. Uh, it is really rare that I will get a question from Amanda that I'll have to sit there and think about it. Uh, most often I can find somewhere in the content outline that I can fit it, or I can immediately say no. Um, and it normally is we can find somewhere to fit it. So let's say that you're discussing um, having a conversation about an adverse event related to a vascular access catheter. That falls under patient safety. That also falls under healthcare communication. So there's lots of different ways that we can do that. However, we want to also give you a resource. Um, if you ever have doubts about, well, I, I don't know about this conference or this topic, and I don't want to spend the money um, unless I know it's going to count, feel free to email Amanda up front at the info at vacert.org, attach the, the sort of brochure, whatever you're looking at, and we'll be happy to take a look at it. Um, if it's something that she can't figure out, she's got readily access to me, and, and I'll be happy to, to take a quick look, and we can get back to you very quickly. Um, recommend from a, a financial standpoint, you do that ahead of time before you register, right? That way you have an answer up front. You've got that email in writing that yes, this would be acceptable and you're good to go. Um, again, our goal is to make this as painless as, as possible for you. Now, if you have to do that after the fact, retrospectively, we can't do anything about it if it doesn't meet the criteria, but we will certainly be happy to review it for you um, as well. So what about the reporting requirements for the documentation to say that, you know, the CE credit is going to actually pass the audit? So there's a couple of things that we've run into. For example, people will send us something that's a blank certificate, or they'll send us a certificate with no, no date um, or no contact hours. And so it's got to have your full name as your certification appears. 
um, the date and the title of the activity, and then the form of accreditation and the number of hours, which would all be contained. So, you know, this is an ANCC accredited hour for 1.0 hours of credit, um, you know, on this date, et cetera. We cannot, unfortunately, take screenshots. So, you know, if you're trying to obtain it from somewhere else, what I really recommend if you've lost the documentation is to contact the C provider um, and ask them to provide you an additional copy of your documentation. Um, they should be able to do that. They, there are records retention policies that most C providers have. Um, and so there may unfortunately be another charge to you to do that because they may charge you to do that. Um, but again, we're always looking for reputable sources, preferably nationally CE accredited. And we've got, again, sort of a, an example list here. And we're also going to give you a website at the end of some other um, things that we don't endorse, um, but we know that are accredited sources of information um, as well. Now, if you're giving a presentation, which is a little bit more tricky, um, the best absolute thing to do is to keep a full copy of your presentation um, that has your name, the date, the title of what you did, a copy of the presentation so we can see its relevance. Um, and then certainly if you have like a brochure where they advertise you or something like that, go ahead and upload that to the activity so Amanda can see it. Um, and that is crystal clear. We can see, hey, this was Amanda. She presented at this conference. Here's her, her name is the speaker. Here's her presentation. She's good to go, right? And again, the more you put in there, uh, the better. So what about um, an in-service, right? This is one that happens quite frequently where you're, you're at work and a, a vendor comes in especially and they do that, or maybe you're part of a vascular access committee at work. Um, so the, the guidelines in the handbook say specifically it needs to be a conference, a seminar, or a workshop in order for it to count, right? So if it's a simple in-service, if it's something a vendor comes in and does, unless they're offering CE, right, it's not going to count towards this. Um, now, if you, you know, are going to present, right, towards, uh, let's say that you present as part of a value analysis committee or a vascular access committee or a patient safety committee, and you do an hour type presentation to a group, we will, we will allow you to count that because you're doing a formal presentation. It's for an hour. We can't accept credits under an hour. Um, and so just like you would do for any other presentation, a copy of that presentation. And it's always good to also have maybe a supervisor note or something like that that says you were asked to do it. And that way it's crystal clear uh, that you were asked to do that. Um, and again, if you're using that same presentation, you do it from multiple different committees within your hospital or facility, we can only allow you to count that once. Um, if it's the same uh, pro program. So what about if you're teaching and you're, you're sort of new hire orientation? Um, you, you can count that, right? As long as you're, again, doing an hour or more and it's gotta be directly related to the vascular access content of the exam um, and you can only count it once. So, you know, I, I know that many of us will do orientations frequently throughout the year. You may do 25 orientations in a calendar year. You can only count that once. So I would, you know, say this is something that you can add to the list, but you can only do it that one time. Um, and then all of your other credits will have to come somewhere else. And again, it needs to be at least an hour in length in order to do that. So what if you lose something? Um, you know, that is, again, unfortunately, your responsibility to keep up with that. And the benefit of the portal is as you earn the credits, log in, scan them in, and actually upload them. Uh, that makes it super easy for you to maintain that information. You know, if you were to ever lose something, you know, we can always help you find it. It's in your portal. It's already attached to your profile. It's going to start tracking those hours for you as well. But we do require that formal certificate that shows that you successfully completed the activity. Um, it can't be a letter of attendance. It can't be a certificate of completion. It needs to be some type of formal attendance that you were awarded hours um, that documents that. Um, and again, the CE providers all maintain this information. So you've got access to that uh, as well. And we unfortunately can't control any fee that they might charge, but at least that way you have some backup in order to do that. So what about um, if you're actually, uh, you know, doing some type of uh, coursework? And we talked about this earlier, right? So the key is they have to be directly related to the content outline. And I'll show you how to do that here in a second. But we talked about sort of the semester versus the, the quarter hour. But if you, again, have doubts about coursework, just like a presentation, email Amanda. Say, hey, this is what my course is going to be. Here's the syllabus is the most important document to send. And then we can quickly take a look at that and, and be able to do that. Um, and we've actually had a few people that thought they were not going to pass audit. And they passed the audit because they were getting a master's degree. And when I looked at their transcript, we were able to pull out enough course content that they actually got many hours um, for their academic uh, credentials that they were earning. 
So again, if you're taking the time, energy, and money to get your master's or doctorate or even bachelor's, we want to reward you, um, especially if it's related to the vascular access content. Uh, so make sure that you know if you have those types of credits, you upload those, or if you've got questions about them, send them in to Amanda and she'll take a look at them for sure. So what about if you didn't pass the recertification exam, right? This is sort of a sticky one. Um, you know, you chose to recertify by exam, you know, God bless. Um, that is not something I would certainly ever recommend doing, but we do have people that do it. And that may be for a variety of different reasons. Um, and that's fine, right? You have the option of recertifying via exam or the option of recertifying via CE. The challenge is you have to pick one. Um, and so if you actually choose and pay to recertify via exam and you pass, I'm sorry, you pass, then you, you pass, right? You're good. But if you fail, then you actually have forfeited your ability to actually recertify via CE, right? And that is clearly in the candidate handbook um, as well. And so your certification would expire at the end of that certification period, and you would actually have to reapply as a new candidate for the exam, which means you got to go through the whole process again, um, you know, reapply through the, the actual exam registration and then actually sit for the exam again. So, uh, you know, not trying to discourage anyone from going towards recertification of the exam, but I would use it sparingly. Um, I would use it, frankly, if you do not have any CE hours and you want to maintain the, the, the certification. I think that's perfectly acceptable there. And there's some people that are fine with that. Um, but really, our goal is to make sure you're getting continuous exposure to high quality education to maintain that cognitive competency that we're trying to to certify with the exam. So what if you give a lecture um, on a vascular access topic? Can you get credit for this? And we covered this in the overall matrix, but yes. So if you are the faculty, the presenter, the speaker, you get credit for that and you get two hours because we're gonna recognize the time that you physically presented that content as well as the time that it took to prepare it. And again, I, I know that one hour is not a lot, but two hours per presentation, if you give, you know, let's just say 10 presentations a year, um, you got 20 hours right there if they're all unique presentations. And again, we want you to maintain some type of documentation that shows that you were the presenter as well as a copy of that presentation in case of audit. So can you submit non-accredited um, courses for CE approval to VAC? So absolutely you can. Um, and there may be instances where your facility or you go to a local conference and they don't have the ability to offer CE, right? As long as, again, as you've got supporting documentation that says you were there for those hours, the number of hours awarded, um, the content, uh, you know, in the form of the title, objectives, whatever it may be, um, that's totally fine. Um, and you can even do that within your own facility as long as it's not an in-service. So it needs to be sort of designated as a workshop or a symposium or a conference internally. And many of you may work for very large health systems that do that. And that's fantastic. I think it's pretty rare that CE is not issued in, in current times. So we, we don't expect to see this a ton, but that is an option should you ever need it um, as well. Um, and then as far as the recertification reminders, we covered this earlier. So just another reminder that you get a total of five, um, you know, guaranteed reminders via email that you would get, but your information has to be um, uh, available and up to date in the, in the portal. And as Amanda mentioned, if you're not getting emails, there's probably something wrong. So make sure that you, you, um, you know, notify the VAC team and they can check your email address as well. So I wanted to sort of quickly go through this and then we'll see what questions you have. So these are the domain categories on the actual exam itself. Um, for those of you that were a little bit uh, late signing in, I'll post here in just a minute um, the file again, but we're gonna upload the actual exam content outlines that you've got that PDF file. We'll make sure Amanda sends it out to you with the recording as well. But these are the categories that you can stick stuff under, if you will, from a CE accreditation standpoint. So if you have a topic, a presentation, you develop a presentation, you attend a presentation, and it fits in these buckets, then you are good to go to count this towards your recertification. So the first one is sort of this clinical knowledge bucket. So things like, you know, what type of device should I use? Should I use a pick line? Should I use this? Remember that this is not a procedural exam but it is a cognitive exam. And so you need to be knowledgeable about many different things. Um, you know, what do I do if I have a thrombosis, right? That would fit under troubleshooting and complications, just as an example. If we look at interprofessional, um, uh, interpersonal and communication skills, right? Do I have somebody that I'm mentoring? Do I have somebody that I'm, I'm shadowing? Um, you know, how do I talk to other disciplines? How do I communicate on behalf of the patient? So in some categories, you may find your content fits under uh, multiple different ones as well. 
professional development is really centered around your continued education journey to make sure that you, re you retain your competency, but also your awareness and, and application of evidence-based practice. So if you are attending something on how to write a professional guideline, that falls with an evidence-based practice um, or about how to teach new clinicians about vascular access, that falls under CE, right? So you can use some of these things pretty liberally. Legal and ethical is one people forget about all the time. So let's say that you go to a conference, a risk manager talks about it and they talk about patient notification of adverse events, bam. You fit right in here in this category. You're talking about ethical considerations of patient transparency and notification, but also sometimes your legal obligations in order to inform a patient of an adverse event, right? So lots of different options for you to have. In addition, on the VAC website, we've included the link here. These are some additional CE options. I want to very clearly state for the record that these are not options that VAC endorses, reviews, or you know we don't solicit these. These are just simply ones that have been provided to us that are accredited. Um, that do have vascular access specific content. And so it's a great reference point for you to go. Um, if you are trying to do things as you know, economically as possible, there are many, many different services out there that offer you either an unlimited plan or sometimes you'll even get free CE um, available. And I think a lot of the vendors have been particularly generous over the, the time with COVID when they could get in front of us um, and offering free CE also. So a couple of parting thoughts before I pull up that uh, reference uh, that I mentioned is at the end of the day, right, our certification is our certification. Um, it is not up to Amanda to remind me that my certification comes up. Um, I will tell you every time my certification comes up, I have this sort of like fear um, that sits in my body until I get, physically get an email back that says I'm, I'm good um, because I want it off my plate. Um, and so many of you may exist in that sort of realm. It's, you know, it's like you don't want to ever let something like that go. But at the end of the day, it's not the responsibility of the team at the VAC office to get our certification um, you know, sort of recertified. It's up to us. We also want to make sure that we include our most current contact information, particular email address, and also a phone number. Right. And, and I would really strongly put in there a cell phone number if possible. They're not going to text you. They're not going to call you unless there's a need to do so. You're not going to get solicitations or, you know, check your auto warranty like we're all getting right now. It's really about if Amanda or Brian need to call you and say, hey, we haven't heard back from you. We want to make sure you're getting this communication. Can you please call us back? Right. They're trying to go an extra mile from a customer service standpoint. Remember that you've also got to track those CEs. And again, strongly encourage you to go back to that certificate portal. Use that portal to your advantage. Put all that stuff in there. Take it off your mind. Take it off your plate. Put it in there so that it lives there. Um, and we want to do this as we get the credits. So I, I've gotten a lot better about this. I used to be somebody that would upload it all, you know, December 1st or whatever it needed to be. Um, I try to do it as I go. Um, and that way that burden is alleviated off of me for sure. And then go back to the recertification handbook and that exam outline. Again, that's gonna really help you identify almost every single question that you have. If you do have additional questions beyond the program today that we um, you know, don't answer for whatever reason, you're welcome to email Amanda at info at vacert.org and she'll make sure to get back to you um, as well. And uh, while Amanda is going to make a couple of, of comments and announcements, I'm going to switch my screen and actually pull up the content outline just to give you an idea of, of what you can sort of use as a guide and a barometer. So Amanda, I'll let you uh, talk for just a second. And I'll pull that up. Sounds great. Yeah. So as Hudson said, um, we're going to be opening up this, this space for questions in a few minutes here once we kind of look at this content outline. But as he said, um, if you have any questions that aren't resolved after today, or if you're kind of going through and you're earning these CEs, if these questions come up for you, it's always better to ask on the forefront instead of, um, let's say, if you were selected for the audit and you suddenly have two, three weeks to kind of get your ducks in a row. Um, it's going to be a little bit more of a stressful time for you if you wait till that back end. So always feel free to email or call us with questions. We are going to be happy to help. So just before we sort of get to any questions that the, the team may have that's joining us today, um, this gives a little bit more granularity. Um, and I'm just going to sort of particularly zoom down here to the patient assessment. And you'll notice that things like vascular uh, pathology, you'll see like impact of disease process or device selection, um, you know, vesicants, osmolarity, all that type of stuff. It gives you a little bit more of a rigid example of, hey, think about these types of terms or these uh, topic areas. And I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, so if you're looking for, you know, how do I know if this fits? 
Like I said, 99% of the time, if you pull this document up, you're going to instantaneously obtain your own answer without ever having to pick up the phone um, as well. And so I really want to make sure that everybody has that accessible. I'm also dropping that again um, in the chat box so that you'll have that. And the team at VAC will also send that out via email so that you've got that. And that is housed on the VAC website uh, as well. So Amanda, do you want to see if we have any questions? Sure, we can open it up for anyone at this time. Um, let me see here. I see we have um, a question in the chat. If I sat for my certification June of 2019, but went to a conference June 7th, 2019, can I use that for CE? That is a great question. Um, so you won't be able to use um, these CEs until you are already certified. So let's say that um, for this person, their certification begins July 1st of 2019. So any credits before then would not be available for CE use. You would have to do them after you've gained that credential. Good question though. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, let me see here. Okay, we have another one coming in. If I am currently involved in work, refreshing our system-wide policies for PIC and midline insertions, including use of 2021 INS standards, does that constitute an activity that can be used as CE credit? If so, for how much? How would I prove my involvement on that committee? So that's a good one. Um, and, and theoretically, this is actually, I think, a great example of, of even an evolution that may take place in the future, but currently, no. Um, there's not a premise or a category that accounts for committee work. Um, so now if you were to do a presentation on that though, Steve, then absolutely. So one thing you might want to think about is if you're, if you're doing like all that work to sort of redocument your policies, and I see you're looking with like Kidoki and stuff like that, then maybe put together an hour presentation and present it back to your group. Um, then that would also meet the standard for sure. But just being on a work group, unfortunately, in the current infrastructure does not afford for that. Uh, but I think that's an excellent suggestion that the VAC team can take back to the board um, and look at for sure. And, 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 you know, more importantly, thank you for taking the time to do that. I think that's really important um, that you're doing that kind of work. And if you have other suggestions, I think that's a fantastic one from Steve. We'd love to hear it um, because if there are other categories, that would be amazing. Um, so we'll go to the next question, Amanda. Um, so Amanda asked, um, she just finished uh, the, she said, I just finished my FNP in August. Can I submit my transcripts for VAC team to see, um, to get some BABC CEs? And who does she submit to? So that's a great question. Um, sorry, Hudson, you can go ahead if you'd like to answer it. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, congratulations um, for sure. So the, uh, the email would be the one that's up on the screen. So you would be sending that to Amanda. Um, and then what I would recommend is if you can do two things. One is on that transcript is highlight the courses that you think are uh, directly applicable to VASCAR Access. And then if possible, when you upload those, include the syllabus for those courses. Um, so let's say that you have somebody that, uh, you know, I don't know, ex I think you said you're doing your family nurse practitioner. So let's just say hypothetically that there was an imaging course or something like that. And there was applicability to vascular access, or there was a specific pathophysiology or something like that, then include the syllabus for that course. And then we can make a judgment on that um, for sure. But, you know, that's a fantastic way to get, uh, you know, credit towards your CE. And again, if you've got stuff like that, that you're doing, we want to make sure you get credit for it when at all possible. Uh, for sure. Okay, does anyone have any additional questions that they'd like to type into the chat? Um, feel free to even unmute if that's something, if it's typing is not, um, if you're at work right now, anything like that, feel free to do that as well. Um, I see we got another question in the chat here. Um, periodically, jo Joseph teaches a class to bedside RNs using ultrasound to place IVs. It's an eight-hour class, including a presentation via PowerPoint and placing lines as a small group. Can this count as a CEU and how much or which category? So 100%, yeah. Um, so this would, this would classify as a workshop. So if we, if we go back to sort of that category, right? Seminar, conference, workshop. So this would really be a, a workshop that you're teaching internally to educate bedside nurses about ultrasound technology for the placement of vascular access devices. So this is gonna meet multiple different categories within the content outline. 
Um, so if you're if you're teaching that, remember you get two hours of credit per hour of pre presentation. Um, so you would you know if it's eight hours, for example, depending upon how you structure it and. Like if it's small group, you may not be presenting. And so you want to take that out. But let's just say you do four hours of didactic teaching, then you get a total of eight hours of credit for that activity. Now you can only count that once. So if you do that same activity four times in a calendar year, you can only count that once. Um, but you know that's something to think about. Uh, and I also saw a question up from Cheryl as, as well. So Cheryl, your question about the, the address with the additional CE sources, um, I'm going to tell you to download the slides when they send them out to you because you're not going to want to copy down that long website address. Um, and it will be a hyperlink that you can actually click in the slides. It's also available on the VAC website um, as well. And actually, if you give me just a second, I will pull that up so you can see where it is. So on the actual, um, and just for everybody to know, so if you're looking for the, the actual content outline, if you go to get certified and go to how to study, you'll see that it's right here. It's the test content outline. Um, but if you're looking for recertification, if you click on continuing education resources, you'll actually click on this first link here, and that's gonna be CE resources. And what I'll do for you just to make it super easy is I'll also drop this in the chat so that you've got that in case you want to go ahead and click that on your browser um, and then you're good to go. So hopefully that takes care of that. But again, you'll be getting that, um, that email from Amanda with the, the slides as well and you'll have that hyperlink also. Perfect. Do we have any more questions from anyone on the call? And I know I'd love to hear if this was helpful for everybody. This is the first time back has done this. So um, we'd love to hear good, bad, or ugly feedback, or you know, hopefully constructive, um, as to whether or not this was helpful for you in the chat. So if you want to drop that in there, we would welcome any and all feedback for sure. Um, and uh, appreciate the time that everybody took out of such a busy schedule to attend today um, as well. Amanda, I don't see any other ones on, on my end, so I'll let you and uh, Brian make any closing comments. Um, perfect. Well, I want to thank all of you again for coming. Um, and I also want to thank Hudson for being here with us today and kind of walking us through this process. Um, like we said, this recording is going to be available later this week um, via email. We'll give you the link to um, our site, as well as um, the link to, like Hudson was talking about, this content outline, um, additional CE resources, and also our recertification toolkit so that you can kind of walk yourself through this process too without having to review this whole presentation if you need just a real quick answer. So thank you all again so much for coming. If you have additional questions, feel free to send them our way, info at vacert.org.